mother and father talked loudly about this dilemma. Both of them new to their jobs and were reluctant to take time off, afraid that this might provide an easy reason for them to get fired. Mother could not risk the new house, the narrow backyard, the paved driveway, and the three bedrooms. Father asked Mr. Lee to come on the day of the nurse's appointment and pretend to be our father. Mr. Lee was one of father's friends from Seoul University. He had been in Canada for several years and he drove a car. His English was good too, smoother than my parents. On the day the nurse was to come, my brother and I sat in our places on the couch watching Commander Tom. We heard a key in the lock and the front door opened. Hi, young Hasio, we chimed as our father's friend stepped into the hallway. Mr. Lee nodded at us, removed his shoes, and eased his feet into a pair of slippers left for guests. I ran into the kitchen to retrieve the plate of food mother had prepared especially for Mr. Lee. Last night at dinner, she had given us strict instructions. You do what Mr. Lee say, mother said, as she placed bowls of steaming mandu in front of us. He is your father tomorrow, and no crying when you get needle, she warned. I will ask Mr. Lee if you cry. The nurse showed up at the beginning of the Flintstones. She was older than mother, but with soft green eyes like Miss Ramola, my kindergarten teacher from last year. The nurse unpacked her bag on the coffee table, her white jacket flapping as she removed vials, swabs, and syringes. The nurse walked over to brother. He retreated into the couch. Mr. Lee said, Yangcha! The nurse has good medicine, so to grow up big and strong. Just like your daddy here, they said, smiling at me. He's not my daddy, my brother said. The nurse looked at Mr. Lee and back at brother and me. Are you the children's father? She asked Mr. Lee. I watched Mr. Lee's stiff facial expression change to a smile. A close family friend, like uncle. Where are the parents, she asked. Busy, just today, Mr. Lee said, the smile still on his face. The nurse turned to my brother. Did, she said, using brother's English name. Who is home when you come home from school? Brother turned his head into the couch, pretending he didn't hear her. I knew he was thinking about the belt hanging in father's closet. The nurse came over and knelt in front of me. She smiled and looked into my eyes. Are you by yourself after school, she asked. The man from the Children's Aid Society came to see us three times after the nurse's visit. The man wanted to speak to brother and me alone, one at a time. We wore our best clothes, me in a dress and brother in a long sleeve shirt. Brother would talk to the man and then it was my turn. He asked many questions about what I ate, where we went to church, how I liked school. The last time he came, mother showed him a piece of paper from the old age home. It showed that mother was on the night shift now, working from 11 at night until the morning. Brother didn't need to wear the house key around his neck anymore. After school, we would climb the stairs and ring the doorbell. We answer the doorbell in her house coat, her hair tussled, her eyes blinking at the late afternoon sun. While we removed our shoes and hung up our coats, she would go into the living room and open the curtains, glancing outside. By the time we dutifully washed our hands, mother would be in the kitchen preparing our snack, walking back and forth between the counter and the fridge, her eyes puffy with lack of sleep. She would sit at the table with us, her chin propped on her hand, looking like a broken bird, while brother and I silently ate our food our legs swinging in our chairs.